continue looking at what it means to have a uh, different type of faith. We've been calling it dangerous faith is what we've been looking at. Just a few minutes, we'll be in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 21, is where we'll be at in just a few minutes. First of all, we want to look at what it means to have a dangerous faith today, and I want to talk to you a little bit about what it means to fight predictability in our lives. Predictability, you know, uh, something that uh, uh, is always there, something we're familiar with. Sometimes predictability is good, but the most of the time, predictability is uh, uh, bad is what we call it. Why do I say that? Because this morning, I want to let you know something. In general, people don't like surprises. Did you know that? You don't like being surprised. Most people in the world today say that they don't like to be surprised. They like things to be predictable. That's what people say, that they want things to be predictable. And in some ways, we need things to be predictable. We need things to be the way it's supposed to be. But surprises make people uncomfortable a lot of times. Surprises make people uncomfortable. And here's what is maybe surprising about the surveys and stuff they do is that church people, people that go to church, are one of the highest percentage of people that don't like surprises. So what they're saying is those of you that are out here today, you are the highest percentage of people that, that like predictability. You like things to always be the same as what the statistics tell us. But this morning, I want us to look at it from a different side. I want us to look at what it means to be unpredictable in God and how God is unpredictable. I want us to look at how this predictability in our lives causes an obstacle or a stumbling block between us and God. I want us to look at this this morning, and I want us to see two people in the Bible that went against the grain. They went against what the world would say, and how these people found that their unpredictable faith led to a changed life and led to them living a life that they never thought that they would have before. And so this morning, we'll be in Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 21, it says, Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for twelve years, and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. And immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any farther? As soon as Jesus heard the words that were spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talith Kumi, which is translated, Little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl arose and walked away, for she was twelve years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it, and said that something should be given her 
to eat. So this morning we see these two people that came before the Lord. And we see the two people that came before Jesus in different ways. And so this morning I want us to look at this obstacle of predictability. How predictability in our lives keeps us from having the faith that we need in God. How predictability keeps us from having the things that God wants us to have. It keeps us away from Him. So the first question to ask is, well, what is predictability? What are you talking about when you say that? That's a common word, but what exactly is it? It means that we know something in advance, or it means that we state that we're going to do something in advance, or it's something that is happening just as we expected it to happen, or it's something that happens the same way all the time. It's predictable. It's easy. We know about it. We know what's going to happen. There's no surprises involved. So when we're talking about in our Christian life, predictability means that we become just like the world. Predictability means there's no difference between the world and the Christians. Predictability means that we're exactly like them. Some person said this, that when you're predictable as a Christian, you're a clone of the world. Think about that. We don't want to be predictable as Christians because we don't want to be just like the world. Because predictability and faith cannot coexist. And you may be saying, wait a second, preacher. What do you mean predictability and faith can't coexist? Being predictable is good. Being predictable is exactly what we want. That's what our faith is all about. Well, what I want us to look at this morning is how predictability actually destroys our faith in God. I want us to look at how predictability actually destroys our faith. I want us to see how it's an obstacle to our faith and how it can destroy that faith that we have in God if we're not careful. And so I want to start out this morning by looking at several ways that predictability gets rid of our faith or slowly erodes or destroys our faith in life. You see, the first thing that happens is predictability makes us the same as the world. Predictability makes us the same or is being the same as the world. The world's goal is to be the same. The world's goal is for all of us to fit in, not rock the boat. It wants us to be predictable. It wants us to do exactly what it tells us to do. That's what the world wants from us. That's what Satan wants from us. In this story, Jairus was a leader of the synagogue. What does that mean? That means that he was a leader leader of the religious place there, the place where they went to worship. He was a leader there, and he was expected to do this. He was expected to trust God, but he wasn't expected to trust Jesus. Jesus was a rebel in that day. Jesus was one that was going against the religious people. He was one that was teaching things that were foreign to them. And so Jairus was supposed to not go to Jesus. He was supposed to be one that was trusting in God at the synagogue there and not go to Jesus. But instead, he went to Jesus. And many people thought it was strange when he did this. Many people thought that He shouldn't have gone to him, that he should have been like them. He should have been like the rest of the world. The woman who had the issue of blood, she wasn't predictable either in her approach to Jesus. She didn't run to Jesus and and say, Jesus, you have to heal me, and Jesus, you have to do this, or Jesus, you have to do that. She simply said, all I need to do is touch his garment. All I need to do is touch him. All she wanted was a simple touch. She wasn't like the rest of the world. And that's what we need to learn today is this, that as we become like the world, our faith begins to fade away because the world says that as we become like them, that there's nothing to believe in. There's nothing to to take hold of, that Jesus Christ is just a myth or Jesus Christ is just a crutch for us. The world wants us to be like them and say there is no hope for anything. This world is all we have. This world is it, and there's no hope beyond that. It's what the world wants us to say. The world wants to give us a reason to lose our faith. The world wants to give us a reason to lose our faith because it wants us to be just like them. It wants us to be just like it is. So the world wants us to become predictable. Now, the next thing that happens is when we have predictability, we become complacent. It makes us complacent in our lives. We become complacent. Well, complacency means that we just don't care anymore. Complacency means that we just don't care. 
Complacency means that the world can go on, church can go on. I'm happy exactly where I'm at. We don't want to know the outcome. We don't care about the outcome. All we care about is what's happening right here, right now, and I'm, I'm fine just the way I am, preacher. That's what complacency does. And I'm here to tell you that complacency is killing our churches today. Too many Christians in the world, we've become complacent. We've become numb in our spiritual lives. We don't feel anymore. We've become predictable in what we say and in what we do. We've been talking about this on Wednesday night about worship, about how everybody knows exactly those that aren't here today. We've got several people that are traveling on vacation this morning, and, and they can look at their clock and they can say, it's 1134, the preacher's up there preaching right now. They could have looked at their clock at 1115 and said, it's 1115, they're probably having the children's service right now. We've become predictable in our worship. And that predictability leads us to be complacent. We've become complacent. We've got to where we don't care about the spiritual things. As long as we're going through the motions, we're all right. Complacency is when we see God do a great miracle. And we say, that's nice, and we just keep walking on by. Complacency hinders our faith by telling us, does it really matter? Does it really matter? You see, complacency was not in the life of Jairus or this woman. Jairus and the woman were anything but complacent. Their fears and despair kept them, kept them from not caring about anything. They cared so much that they fled to Jesus Christ. There was no complacency in their lives. There was desperation in their lives. There was desperation in their needs. There was fear in their needs. So predictability makes us like the world. It leads us to be complacent, but then it makes us become satisfied with our spiritual life. Become satisfied with your spiritual life. Let me ask you a question. Are you happy? Are you satisfied with the things the way they are today? Are you satisfied with the way things are today in your life? Are you satisfied with the way that you know Jesus Christ? Are you satisfied with your spiritual life today? Unfortunately, many people say, I'm completely satisfied, preacher. I come to church on Sunday morning. It's good. As long as the preacher doesn't preach too long and I get home in time for lunch, I'm okay, right? We're okay with these types of things. Sunday morning service is good. And as long as I have that, I'm good. As long as I've got good songs to sing, we're good. I get a good feeling when I hear the songs and I get to sing the songs. I get a good feeling. And I'm satisfied would that be in my spiritual life? That's what predictability does. Because when we become satisfied, we're like, I want it to be the same over and over and over again. I don't want it to be different. But the Bible tells us that we should always hunger and thirst for the Lord. We should never be satisfied with what God is doing in our life. We should never be satisfied with what God wants to give us because God is going to give us until our cups overflows, the Bible says, and then He's going to keep on giving. We can never be satisfied with Him. But predictability leads to that satisfaction. It leads to us saying, I'm just happy the way I am. Just keep going, and everything's going to be all right. But that's not the way it should be. The next thing that we learn from this is that predictability leads us to a fear of risk-taking. Predictability leads to us playing it safe. I just can't take any risk. Imagine Jairus here. His daughter is dead or dying. He leaves the synagogue to go find Jesus, and I'm sure people are telling him, why are you going to Jesus? Why are you going to him? Here's this lady. She's had this issue for years. She's tried everything. She's done everything, spent all of her money. The doctors can't help her. said it even grew worse. Here it is, so many people around Jesus Christ that he can barely walk. He's walking down the road, and here she comes up, and all she wants to do is just touch him just a little bit. All she wants to do is touch the hem of your garment. 
She was taking a risk by doing this because in the law of that day that if she touched anybody, they would become what they called unclean and they would have to go and go through this whole ceremony to become clean again because she touched them. So by her going to Jesus Christ and just trying to touch him was a risk that she was taking. Jairus going to Jesus Christ asking for his child to be healed by Jesus, this outsider, this one that was causing trouble in Jerusalem. Because of him going to Jesus Christ, it was a risk. I'm here to tell you this morning, if you're going to follow Jesus Christ, if you're going to follow God, and you're going to have a faith that follows God, it's going to take risk on your part. It's going to take risk in your part. It's going to take you turning your predictable, safe life into a dangerous life for God. We're going to have to overcome the fear of taking risk. The next thing it does is it causes us to rely on religion instead of God. Relying on religion instead of God. You see, when we decide that our life is fine, then we get into religion, not into God. What do I mean by that? Well, we got a great church here. Mount Pleasant Baptist is a good church. The Southern Baptist Convention, we feel like it's pretty good. We feel like it's safe. Why? Because they're known, they're predictable, we know exactly what we're getting into. But the problem is, is many people follow the religion and the people instead of following God. And so what we have to do is we have to stop following the religion and we have to follow the God that created it all and loves us. Faith is based on the unpredictability of what God does and His goodness toward us. The lady going to Jesus Christ, she wasn't going to Him for anything but healing. Her faith brought the healing. He looked at her and says, Your faith has made you whole. She wasn't going to the the priest. She wasn't going to religion. She was going to Jesus Christ. She was going to God. The Jairus, he had religion. He was a leader of the synagogue. He had all the religion he he wanted. But he knew the religion wasn't going to help him. So what did he do? He sought Jesus Christ. He sought God. It is not religion that helps us. It's not religion that saves us. It is only Jesus Christ that saves us. Religion does nothing for us. It is only Jesus Christ. You see, our religion today loses that faith. It takes the faith away from God and puts it into man. So how can we get away from being predictable? How can we get away from it? Well, I could have come in here this morning and, and I could have said, take your bulletin and turn it upside down and we're going to do everything in reverse. I'm going, to pray, I'm going to preach first and then we're going to sing and then we're going to do that. I could have done that. And most of y'all would have been losing your mind this morning going, what's happening, right? We could have just turned everything upside down, make it unpredictable. But what happens if we do that? We get uncomfortable. We get uncomfortable when things are unpredictable like that. So how do we get over this? How do we overcome those and begin to take risk in our life? How do we do that? Well, the first thing we do is we simply go to Jesus. We simply go to Jesus. And not go to Jesus on on a Sunday morning while you're listening to me preach. Not going to Jesus on a Wednesday night if you come to Bible study. You're going to Jesus with everything in your life. The, the man, Jairus, the woman that had the issue of blood, they both approached Jesus. They took different paths, they took different ways, but they both sought out Jesus Christ. Why? Because they thought Jesus was the only hope. And you know what? They were right. Jesus was their only hope. You and I today need to be seeking Jesus more and more and more. But instead, what do we do? We seek the world. Got a problem? Go to Google. It can solve everything, right? Got a problem? Pick up the phone. Call your neighbor. Call your your family. They can solve it all. We don't go to Jesus Christ. Jairus had a problem. The woman had a problem. What did they do? They sought Jesus Christ. They sought, in their case, the unknown. We know Jesus is hope. We know Jesus is love. But we never will know how he can change our lives if we don't seek him. If we don't seek after him and go after him. And when we do, our world will change. Our world will change. So they sought him. 
The next thing you want to do if you want to get rid of predictability is stop listening to the world. Don't listen to what the world has to say to you. Stop listening to them. I believe as Christians we spend too much time listening to the world and not enough time listening to God. Let me say that again. We spend too much time as Christians listening to the world instead of listening to God. Okay? And we need to understand how to listen to God. Jesus was about to change the world of these two people, and they didn't even know it. I want you to imagine this. Here is Jesus. There are so many people around Jesus, he can barely walk. And he's walking through there, through the crowd. This lady touches him. The woman touches him. And he feels the power come out of him. He turns around. He looks at his disciples, and he says, Who touched me? And they looked at him like he was crazy. They looked at him like, do you see all the people around you, Jesus? What do you mean, who touched you? Jesus could have looked at them, the world, and said, okay, let's just keep going. But instead, he knew what had happened. The world wanted to show Jesus that he just needed to keep on going, but instead, he knew what happened. He was going to listen to God and what God was trying to teach the people at this time. And so he turned around, and he found the woman that was there, and he found the woman that touched her, and he knew who she was, and he knew what had happened to her, and he wanted to show her that her faith had made her whole. And then Jesus went to the house. And as Jesus got close to her, as Jesus finished, the people from the house came and they said, too late, your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. You come on home with the rest of us and mourn and let the teacher keep going about his business. But instead, Jesus Christ said, let's go. She's not dead. There's still hope. There's still help. But if Jesus would have listened to the world, The voice of the world says, you don't need Jesus. There's no more hope. Keep going on. If you and I today want to learn what it means to lose the predictability and take a risk in our life, then we've got to stop listening to the world telling us that it's okay. Go on without Jesus Christ. And we have to follow wherever he takes us. Because as we follow him and as we go where he tells us to go and we do the things he tells us to do, then guess what? Things change. Our lives change. People's lives change and things become better. If you want to overcome predictability, start listening to God and not the world today. Put the world on hold and listen to God for a while and see how your voice in your life changes. The next thing we need to do is we need to continue following him even in the face of ridicule. Follow Jesus in the face of ridicule. So Jesus gets to the house Jesus comes here, he gets to the house, everybody's wailing, everybody's crying, the the 12-year-old girl is dead, The, the, the whole household is in an uproar, and Jesus comes in, and he looks at them, and he says, why are you so upset? She's not dead. And what does the Bible say they begin to do to him? Ridicule. They laugh at him, they ridicule him. And Jesus said, leave. Told them all to leave. He's like, just get out. The only people left were the parents, Peter, James, and John. But what could have happened there? Jesus could have said, well, you laugh at me, I'm leaving. You laugh at me, my power's no good. But that's not what happened. Jesus didn't cower before the world. You and I can't cower before the ridicule of the world because this world today, I don't have to remind you all of this, but this world today... If you mention you're a Christian, then you're already wrong. Just by the mere mention of the word Christian. You're already being ridiculed. You tell someone you come to church this morning, the majority of the world today, that's a ridicule on you. What we've got to learn is that when that ridicule comes, we don't walk away. We stand up on the truth of God is what we do. We stand on the truth of his word and we watch God work. The easy way out is for us to leave. The easy way out for us to be predictable. See, the predictable thing to do is whenever trouble comes, we just walk away. We leave. That's the predictable thing to do. The easy way out is to cower before the world. But the unpredictable thing is this. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And whatever God calls me to do, I'm going to do it. And if that's to stand up for his truth, I'm going to do that regardless of what is said to me or about me. If you want to be a dangerous Christian, a dangerous faithful Christian, then you need the ability to stand up to the ridicule and continue following Jesus no matter what is said to you or about you in this world today. 
Understand that you need to be faithful to Jesus Christ and not to the world. Continue following in the face of ridicule. And finally, this last one, I called it Don't Be Tamed. Refuse to be tamed. There's a book series called The Chronicles of Narnia. I'm sure most of you have heard of it. Many of you probably read it by C.S. Lewis. Inside of that book, there is a lion called Aslan. And that lion, he is the picture of God in the book. He's the, the picture of God that we have. And here's what they say about him in the book. They say that Aslan is not safe. He's anything but safe. He's good. He's the king. And that he is wild and he's not a tame lion. That's what they say about him in the Chronicles of Narnia. He's not a tame lion. Well, what does that mean that he's not a tame lion? What does that mean that you and I don't need to be tame? You see, the people in the world want to see this nice, nice picture of Christianity where everything's all in order and everything's exactly the way it should be and that Jesus is in their lives, but Jesus isn't changing their lives. That's what we mean by being tame. We want a predictable life where Jesus is in it, but he's not doing anything to change us. We want a Jesus that is tame. We want God to be one that says, I, I'm here, but you can just ignore me. It's what it means to be tame, but Jesus Christ doesn't want that. Jesus Christ wants us to be not tame in our lives. Jesus Christ wants us to understand that He is grand. He is beyond our imagination. That He is powerful. He is gentle. And He is our hope. But that He is not tame. And He is unpredictable in our lives. What do I mean by that? Well, let's just look at Jesus' life for a second. When Jesus came into the world, it was a surprise. Even though God had told them that Jesus was coming the way he came, Jesus, God told them everything, but yet it's caught everybody by surprise. His ministry upon this earth was a surprise. The people in his day considered him a rebel, not a God. They considered him one that upset the order of things. Think about this. Jesus goes to a leper that wasn't supposed to be touched, and he touches him and heals him. There's a blind man that needs to be healed. And what does Jesus do? He spits on the ground, makes some dirt, some, some clay, puts it on his eyes, and he heals the blind man. Think about this. There's a woman with an issue of blood, and what does he do? Just by a touch, she is healed. There is a girl that is thought to be dead, and Jesus goes, and he tells her to rise up, and what does she do? She rises up. Lazarus was in the tomb for four days. And what does Jesus do? Lazarus come forth. And what happens? He starts walking out of the tomb. You see, Jesus didn't come in the world to keep it tame. Jesus came to make a change. Jesus came to change our lives. And to do that, it has to be unpredictable. There's a story in the Bible where they needed some money to, for the taxes that had to be collected. What did Jesus do? He said, go catch a fish, open the mouth of the fish, and guess what you're going to find in the fish? Just enough money to pay your taxes. You see, Jesus, he came in the world to change the world. Jesus turned the world upside down because he wasn't predictable. Jesus turned the world upside down because his faith wasn't predictable, and that's what he wants from us today. He wants us to have this unpredictable faith in our lives. He wants us to say, Jesus, I want you to be active in my life. Jesus, I don't want you to just be in my life and my life be the same. Jesus, I want you to be in my life and I want you to change my life. Imagine the woman now. All of a sudden, a lifetime of ailments are gone. Her life was changed. Jairus, Jairus goes back and his daughter is now alive and she's well. His life has changed forever. Not because they just let Jesus come into their life, but because they let Jesus change their lives. And that's what we have to do today. Jesus wants to change our lives today. We're good at letting Jesus in. We're good at saying, Jesus, you can have a part of my life, and Jesus, you can sit up here on the shelf in my life, and you're fine sitting there so I can show everybody that I've got Jesus right here, and we're good, and he's in my life, and he stays right here on the shelf. But that's not what God wants from us. God wants Jesus to come into our lives, and he wants Jesus to change our lives. So my question this morning is this. Are you satisfied with your predictable spiritual life? Or are you ready to step out in faith and let God change your life today? 
Are you ready to say, God, I want more than just Jesus being on a shelf in my life, and I want God to be active in my life? You see, Jesus wants to give you this abundant life. Jesus wants to make your life wonderful. But when he does that, our lives become unpredictable. Our lives go from what we're used to to something we've never imagined before. Imagine sitting in your boat, mending your nets, and Jesus walks by and says, put them all down, come and follow me. What did they do? They put their nets down and they come and followed him. Imagine sitting at your tax collector table like we talked about last week and Jesus says, put it all away, come and follow me. What did he do? He put it all down and he came and followed him. There's a song that says they did it not for fame or fortune, but because it was Jesus who called them. And that's what I ask you to do today. Step out in faith like that today, not because you want something out of it, not because of what may be promised, but step out of it so that Jesus can change your life, so that Jesus can make you different today, so Jesus can take your satisfied life and make it an abundant life today. That's our prayer this morning. And it all starts by being like the woman and being like Jairus. It starts with us seeking Jesus Christ. We either seek him for the first time for the forgiveness of our sins and so that we can have that life, or we seek him to come into our life and change our lives today. But whatever it is, this, it's safe to say this, all of us need it in our life, need Jesus in our lives. All of us today need him. And all of us should be ready to say, Jesus, I want you to change my life today. Not just be in it, but I want you to change it today. Look to God and say, God, add a little bit of dangerous faith to my life so that it's not so predictable. Call me out of the boat. Call me away from the table. Heal me from what I've been, what's been ailing me. Heal, heal my family. Change my life today, Lord, so that I can grow closer to you and so that my faith can be a faith that changes this world today. Let us pray. Father, we just come before you this morning, and Lord, as we think about our lives, and Lord, the, the things that are safe in our life, Lord, I pray this morning that you will help us find you. Help us find Jesus Christ today. Help us find this faith that says, Lord, I want you to change me today. Father, help us to be brave like Jairus and the woman were. Lord, they approached Jesus in the crowd with everybody watching and everybody around, Lord, but they still sought Jesus for help. Lord, their faith drove them to Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray this morning that our faith will drive us to you today. Lord, as we come together for a time of decision-making, Lord, as we come together for a time of, 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 of invitation, Lord, to come to you, Father, I pray that this morning, Lord, you will help us seek you more today and that we will come and allow you to change our lives.